Welcome in, Hokies fans, to this edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We record on Monday, September 5th, and Tech fans, it's time to talk about it. On episode 252 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, we'll take a deep dive into the Hokies' loss to Old Dominion on Friday night. We're going to rip the Band-Aid off in the first half, talk about everything that went wrong, all the mistakes for Virginia Tech. But in the second half, we'll get a little bit of the bright side. We'll look at some of the silver lining and some things to look forward to moving forward in the season. All of that and much more coming up on episode 250. 52 of the Tech Sideline podcast, which starts right now. Welcome into episode 252 of the Tech Sideline podcast. I want to remind you that Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company, one of the nation's leading community banks. First Bank and Trust is a nationally ranked community focused bank with over 30 locations throughout Virginia and Northeast Tennessee, with an additional presence in North Carolina. They offer free checking with inter- industry leading mobile banking, financing solutions for personal, agriculture, business, commercial, and mortgage needs, and more. Visit www.firstbank.com to learn more more. It's time to talk about it, guys. The Old Dominion loss once again on Friday night, second time in five years. The Hokies have don- gone down to Norfolk and lost to the Monarchs. Want to introduce everybody on set across the way, making his return after being behind the scenes for the last couple weeks, founder and general manager Will Stewart. To my right, lead analyst and columnist Chris Coleman. In the fourth chair today, Katie Adams once again. Behind the scenes, Nick Brown making his return to the production side, our new greatest podcast producer in the land. And I'm Jake Lyman, your host. Uh, Before we get into everything, I I just want to ask you guys, what was the experience like being down there uh, in in the 757 and and being able to watch the game in person for Will? I know uh, Chris had a little bit more struggles (laughs) trying to get there. I'll I'll take it first. Um, Sure. So I stayed with a buddy of mine in Virginia Beach, got there Wednesday night and didn't leave till Sunday. So I was I was there for a number of days and had a great time seeing all my old college buddies. You know, we. uh, we had a ball. Chris and I toured a submarine on uh, Thursday. The USS John Warner. The USS John Warner. Virginia class Virginia nuclear class. submarine. Pr- pretty really cool list item. Got to sit in the pilot's seat. Everything. Got, got a great tour. I think the only things we need to see was the engine room, which would make sense. They yep, don't want to allow nuclear <laughs> reactors. And the, the uh, ESA. Yeah, ESA and the radio room. room and the bridge. Measures. But other than that, we got a, we yeah. got a full tour. That's really cool. And people were like, what would you think? And I said, the single most interesting thing was sitting in the pilot's seats. One of their controls is an Xbox controller. Literally an Xbox controller. It's not an Xbox-like controller. It's, it's an actual <laughs> Xbox You could go to engine. Walmart and buy this. And this is one of the tools they, they use to drive multi-billion dollar nuclear submarines yeah. amazing yeah. i wonder how much microsoft's getting paid for that it was it was like <laughs> i'm just looking at it like it's got the xbox logo oh, if, right. if, if you're microsoft you're charging the government at least a hundred dollars per controller because you know they're going to pay it it's funny because i worked out in the engineering world for a while on some military projects and and things are designed to military specifications there like you have to be able to drop stuff and have it not break it has to be able to uh survive these electronics have to be able to survive through extreme heat and extreme cold and i'm looking at an xbox controller on a submarine (laughs) chris i know you had a a little bit of struggles trying to get to the game that 757 traffic got to you oh yeah uh ended up in the same traffic jam you did i left it like where i was staying on the peninsula at like 2.30, 2.30, 2.45, something like that probably, and hour and 45 minutes to two hours later, I'm still on the peninsula. My GPS took me down a route to take a left to go on the 64. As it turned out, it was a roadblock. So I had to get back on uh, 64 West, and I kept going up 64 West and just the traffic jam to even get on the in the tunnel. And I, it just looked to me like I was going to be in traffic until – I might not get there until 6 or 6.30 or something like that. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go watch this sucker back at the beach bar where I'm staying. (laughs) And I'm glad I did. Yeah, so I read a lot of comments from fans on the message boards about just just going off on ODU Stadium and what trash it was and all that stuff. And I don't know. I didn't didn't really think or feel that. Uh, Wound up sitting in the end zone about 20 rows up. And it was one of those games where, you know, we, we've all, if you've been to enough football games, you wind up sometimes in the end zone. And there are games where the whole game takes place in front of you. And there are games where the whole game takes place at the other end. You got no idea what's going on. 
And there is only one video board in uh, ODU Stadium, and it happens to be in the end zone we were in. So I'm leaning out, <laughs> trying to watch that thing, you know. So um, a lot of a lot of what happened in the game, I didn't really have a feel for it till I got home and got to watch it on television. And I didn't get home till like four o'clock yesterday. So I watched the game last night and. Yeah, and I I know what you're saying there with the video board. We I went down and broadcast the game for 3304 Sports, and we were set up on a table right behind the student section. Couldn't see the video board. Couldn't see the left side of the field. It was a <laughs> it was a mess at times, but yeah, that's, we made it's it work. Hard to do play by play when you can't see anything. We made it work. We made it work. It didn't mm-hmm. turn out as bad as I thought it might at the very beginning. But uh, I do want to mention if you are in the YouTube chat, please leave a comment or question for Will and Chris. We'll get to those at the end of the show. Also, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on notifications to make sure you don't miss any Tech Sideline podcast this season. So now that we've gotten through your guys' experience of the game, let's start with the bad from Friday night's game. We're going to get to the good stuff later on, uh, but let's start with the mistakes. I feel like when you look at this game, you can really boil it down to those mistakes. Turnovers, penalties. Let's start with the turnovers. The biggest one of the game was the high snap on the field goal attempt. Really a 10-point swing. You would think that William Ross is going to make that 38-yard field goal. So takes three points off. The Hokies score adds seven to Old Dominion. That that's the play that lost the game. You you know there's so much else that happened in the game, but right. really that's the one that if, you can boil it down if, to. If there's one play, yes, that would be the one. Yeah. Um, because even if Tech had missed the field goal, you know it's, you're talking. It, it, it's it wouldn't seven, have had three. the seven points. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, that's it. And that's one of the things you can't predict. Like you can't predict things like bad field goal snaps, or if you're LSU last night, you can't predict a blocked extra point and two muff punts. Right, uh, and East Carolina had the same deal. Where I think they had a they had a chance to tie NC State and just miss the extra point. They missed an extra point and the game winning field yep. goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the last few minutes of the game, um, and those are the types of things in football you can't predict. That was the biggest play, I would say. But it, the thing is, if Tech if if Tech had done everything else right, that would have just been a glitch. Yeah, uh, you yeah. know, uh, I, I think there, there's a lot of different things that and if that went wrong and the, the Tech did poorly. And if any one of them they had done better, they still would have won the game. That's how much better they were than Old Dominion. I know. Yeah. Like, like if Old Dominion was close to Virginia Tech's ability level, they would have won that game by two or three touchdowns. Instead, they barely squeaked it out. Like, so you've got 15 penalties for 106 yards, the most penalties by a Virginia Tech football team since the 2005 ACC championship game. Yeah, which is one you don't want to remember. That was <laughs> no, a horrible no. one. Um, <laughs> It was horrible this game. Yeah, uh, you got four interceptions. You've got uh, here's one of the one not a lot of people are talking about. I mean, Tech probably lost fifty or sixty yards in field position due to not fair catching punts. Yep, yep. And so you put those that let's just say it's fifty yards. You put that with the one hundred and six penalty yards. That's one hundred and fifty six lost yards. It's a ton of hidden yardage. Hidden yeah. yardage, exactly. Um, and like I said, you do any one of those things better. You win, you win the game. And uh, there were so many bounces that didn't even go Tech's way. Obviously, you know? on the on the botched field goal. Yeah, you know, um, I, I was not aware that a long uh, that a long snap could roll that far <laughs> under its own power, forty yards or whatever. And then um, was it uh, was it Peter Moore that tried to slide on it yes. first? Yeah. Was he was yeah. he the holder on that play? And another fifteen yards, and then of course, just in the ninety three Independence Bowl. When the field goal was blocked and the Hokies were running after it, it hopped right up into somebody's stomach, Lawrence Lewis's stomach, mm-hmm. and that exact it same stuck. thing happened. It hopped right up into that ODU guy's stomach. Too bad the, Peter Moore didn't use that big leg. He's gotten just kick just it out of the back of the end zone. <laughs> the, um, the ball goes off of Jalen Holston's hands late in the game, goes straight to an ODU player, whereas there was a, another play, I think, in the fourth quarter where Tech batted down a pass by Hayden Wolf. Ball goes fluttering. It's in the air for a good second or two. There's nobody around. So in addition to the self-inflicted stuff, a lot of it's just luck. And in these games that wind up being one-score games, you can what-if yourself to death and just go through all of that and drive yourself crazy. Ultimately, you can only control what you can control. You can't control the bounces, yeah. but you know you can control the penalties. You can control the fair catches. You, you can control the interceptions to a certain extent. Um, and they just, it was disappointing. Like, you know, everybody knows the, the term uh, disappointed, but not disheartened 
Well, I mean, that was disappointing and disheartening. Um, it's it's one thing, like, but the last time Tech lost Old Dominion, you could at least you know tip your cap to ODU because Tech got outplayed. Tech could have played. Yes. Tech could have played better in that game, but ultimately there were there were talent issues on defense, major talent issues on defense. Like some of the guys they were playing on defense in that game ended their careers at places like UMass and William and Mary and Duquesne and not even starting at those places. Right. And Virginia Tech had to play them in that football game and, and they lost. So, but, and so an OD, ODU went out there and took advantage of that and, uh, and smack tech in the mouth and won. tip your cap. They didn't have to do anything the other night. No. Uh, you can't even say they took advantage of their opportunities because they didn't score their first offensive touchdown until just about the last play until their last offensive play of the game. Yeah. Uh, so that's the that's the frustrating part of it. And Pry said it after the game. He's like, "You you want to make them earn it," and Tech and, did not make them earn it. Yeah, don't don't hand it to them. And so that that ODU game four years ago, uh, um, ODU had some very good talent at wide receiver that night. And 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 I think one of those guys may have even gotten drafted. I think he's still in the Travis NFL. Fulgham. He he was with the Eagles for a while. I think he got released. I want to say, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. But that team, that team was not good. ODU went four and eight that year, and I got the same vibe watching them Friday night. They're not, they're not a good team. I don't want to insult them, you know. If I can, can see the comments, no, oh, yeah, but you lost to them. You're crying, but I just, they did not strike me as a team that's going to go and win seven or eight, or eight games or something like that. They may, if they play like they did the other night, they're probably look at an, another four and five win season. They had one guy offensively that could athletically match Tech, and that was Alex Jones. About- who started yes. his career at West Virginia, so that makes sense. But that tight end that everybody hypes up, I said last week on the podcast that he's as slow as an offensive guard, <laughs> and Tech's athleticism is going to match up great with him, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's, he can't compete at, at, against ACC-level athletes, and, and most of their team can't. I thought Watson and, was pretty good. They're running back. Yeah, he, he's yeah, solid. Yeah. He's solid. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, just as far as the passing game goes, they had one guy that could do anything against ACC-level athletes, and that's it. And somehow Virginia Tech and still did, managed to lose the, the football. In the fourth quarter, game. he did. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. No. Let's let's speak of that. <laughs> I, I want to uh, before I forget it. So th- this is going to make you smile, and it's also going to make you cringe. Uh, ODU was one of five when targeting Dorian Strong for a twenty percent completion rate. That's fifth in the he, he, out of all cornerbacks in the country. He ranks fifth in an opponent's completion percentage. Minimum 40 snaps. So basically any starting quarter in the country, he was fifth best after week one. This weekend. This weekend. No one pass he gave up was that one at the end of the game. And that gets into something that we'll get into later about just just somebody make a play. You know, Dorian Strong is a good football player. He is, yeah. Didn't make a play there, you know, and their guy did. Yep, and we'll dive more into the defense later on, but I did want to throw this out. That 2018 game, the Monarchs, I want to say, had over 500 yards total offense. I think it was over 600. So it might have been over 600. It was 600. Who's yeah. counting? The and they point. had 49 points. Monarchs had 245 total yards on on Friday night, averaged 2.4 yards per carry on the ground, and Hayden Wolf was 14 for 35 throwing the football. So, it it yeah, like Tech you said, they gave it away. Dominated the game. Um, by the end of the game, ODU was basically relegated to just heaving up prayers and hoping they got completed. And they, they, they hit a couple of them in, in the fourth quarter. Uh, those are very, very low percentage plays, but that's all they could do. Yep. So it, it's like I would, I'd be, if I'm a Tech defensive player, I'm probably not a happy camper after no, that game. You, you look at ODU's uh, drive chart, and just like in Office Space made in 1999, my printer wouldn't work this morning, so I don't have it right in front of me. But if, if you look at ODU's, drive chart their first 11 drives resulted in like something like 127 yards of advancement down the field not offense because those drive charts include penalties and things like that their first 11 went 127 yards their last three went like 157 yards you know fourth there, there were two of those heaves yeah in, in, both in the Jennings. Jennings. Yeah, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. both to Jennings who, who I think is a good player and yeah, if, if I if I could take one player off their team, it would be him. Yep. And we've alluded to the interceptions too. Let's talk about Grant Wells. One of the biggest question marks with Wells was could he take care of the football? And you can't blame him for all four interceptions. Mm-hmm. The one that hit Holston right in the chest and just bounced up and like you said, yeah. somehow bounced right to an ODU linebacker. And the last one was desperation with fifteen seconds yeah. left in the game. You had to throw and it. Wasn't there one at the end of the 
first half. I mean, oh yeah, uh, it was the hell mary in the end zone. Fortunately, they didn't. Oh, that was it. That was incomplete. It was, that was incomplete. Yeah. So the other two was the overthrow on the corner route early which, on in the game, which actually wasn't even like like Smith ran a post type and he threw the, the corner. Like, so we we don't know who was right there. Yeah. So it could have just been a miscommunication, right. and then the other one was they ran hurry up after a big play, and he had an out route jumped. Uh, I want to say right. yes. Right. They did the and they they those corners that corner was parked on it like they yes. were, they were not respecting Virginia Tech's deep threat at all. They weren't respecting Tech's wide receivers' ability to beat them deep. Like you, you got to think after you saw how tight they were playing uh, Lofton on that play that you come out and try and out and up. Or something yeah. like that, and 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 you didn't see that. Um, yeah. I will say this about Wells: he was Virginia Tech's third highest grading offensive player at a seventy-one point nine. Now these are preliminary, uh, preliminary grades, right. and I'm going to do my inside the numbers articles on Thursdays this this year to make sure PFF has because time the grades to finalize. change throughout the whole right, 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 right. right. Um, but five receiving targets, whether they're running backs, tight ends, or receivers. All had passing grades below the baseline average of 60. So Holston, Blumrick, Kakavitsis, Blue, and Gosnell all have passing grades like below, below 60, 60 yeah, which wow. is your which is your baseline average. Yeah. Caleb Smith was the highest grading receiver, but he was only on the field for 10 passing plays. Wow. So after he went out, it was basically Lofton and Gallo versus the entire ODU pass defense. Those other guys were not. They, they were way subpar. Like ba- they could not get separation, um, and there was certainly a lack of trust. And are you going to trust guys that aren't getting separation? You're just going to throw it out there. He did at one point the, the the early deep ball to Caleb Smith and 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 completed it, and that's where you saw his talent level. Yeah. Uh, but like, I I I think some of that is so much newness. Like you've got a new quarterback two transfer receivers and plus text returning players and all that together playing in a new offensive system for the first time. And to top it off, you know, you've got Jaden blue who you expect to be one of your top two or three receivers. And he misses most of August with an injury and is nowhere near a hundred percent. I mean, even Gosnell missed a week or two yeah. leading up to this game with an injury. So you needed those guys to, to be there to work with Grant Wells to continue to progress the passing game, but they weren't there you know, for a good chunk of the preseason. So I I guess that I want, in hindsight, I'm not not too terribly surprised considering all, all of that. Um, I don't think the Tech passing game will be as bad as it looked in week one if they can get guys healthy. Yeah. Now, if if you can't get guys healthy, then you, you, you're, you're off. in for a long year. But I, I don't think I don't think Friday night is is conducive to to like who Grant Wells is as a player. He has struggled with interceptions in, in, the, in the past and, and things like that. But at the same time, like people who have watched, gone back and watched the tape who were neutral, like they aren't biased either way. And what they take away from watching the game is that Tech's wide receivers were pretty darn bad. Because they weren't getting open. Right, because they weren't getting open. So that throws everything off, timing, everything. So, uh, I think that that whole unit has growth potential, but they're not there right now, and they need to get healthy. And I, it, you know, Caleb Smith was playing a good game. Yeah, uh, he was on the field for ten passing snaps and caught three passes. And um, so Smith caught the thirty-nine yarder early. That's right. Gosnell caught a twenty-four yarder. That was with ten minutes to go in the second quarter. Yes. And Tech did not complete another pass beyond twenty yards, and really didn't even try that many. Um, Which is, yeah, and I, you know, you'd, I'd have to go back and watch the film and see how ODU was playing Tech. Obviously, both coaching staffs, we talked about, have great familiarity with the each, with each other and what they wanted to do offensively. So we said from an X's and O's standpoint, this game, it was going to cancel each other out from an X's and O's because both staffs knew yep. what the other staff was going to do. Um, it, it is, I guess, kind of strange to when you talk about the Tech coaches saying, we probably need to try three or four deep shots per quarter with Grant Wells, and then you basically don't do it at all. Now, there, may, there, may, there were, I'm looking at the chart here. There were nine passing attempts over 20 yards. Okay. One of those is at the end of the first half. One of them was at the end of the game. So there's really seven 
well, in non Hail Mary situations. Three of those were at the end three of the of game. They the he last threw three plays of the game. Three jump balls at the end. Right, right. right so, so it's even. Yeah. So yeah, it's just not that many. You're basically talking one and a half per quarter. Yeah. If that. And uh, I, some of that could be due to ODU. I mean, te- there was a lot of room for Tech's tight ends. So maybe the ODU was keeping their safeties back to deny those deep balls. Now, this is one thing where, you know, fans complain about coaches don't say don't say much and they're glad the the new tech staff says more than the old staff but when you basically go out there and say hey we're going to throw the ball deep three or four times a quarter and the other team's ready for it imagine that and, right and, and this is why coaches that, that's why most staff don't say anything these yeah, days yeah. and fans complain about it but that's why um so i don't know maybe maybe that's lesson learned i i, I don't know um i will say that like there was so much familiarity between those staffs, like Tech's future. Like Boston College isn't going to have as much of an idea about exactly what Tech wants to do offensively. Now, will that matter with all these injured receivers? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. So, what about what did you think about Lofton? I thought Lofton was maybe the one exception. I thought yeah, yeah, yeah. L- Lofton, Lofton was the one receiver besides Caleb Smith that graded out above average. Yeah, he, he did fine. But but you can't go out there with just one guy capable of making plays. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Grant Wells, again, you look at the, the stat sheet and maybe aren't impressed with the four interceptions, but again, you have to have some context with that. Right. Some of those weren't completely his fault, and I think he did look good. The one thing that I did notice was there were some overthrow issues uh, mm-hmm. at times where it felt like he was airmailing his receivers right. over and over. So so let me let me drill down on the interceptions a little bit. I went back and I pulled up his career game-by-game game stats, and yeah, going in, he had 22 interceptions in what looks like about – I don't know, 21 or 22 games. It's basically averaging one interception a game. Yeah, but yeah. but if you look at uh, his last seven games of last year, he had a total of four interceptions in his last seven games. Right. So in the last seven games of last year, he had cut down on that. Yeah. Um, he was making progress as a quarterback, and then yeah. he decided to play football in Virginia Tech's offense. No. <laughs> um, and he's, you know, he's never had more than there, – there's only one time where he's had more than two interceptions in a game. It was against Rice. He threw five against Rice. <laughs> His his freshman year, his right. first year, and uh, that that's that's a head scratcher. Uh, but other than that, it's zero, one, or two until you know Friday. Uh, yeah, night. and like the total number of interceptions is high, relatively speaking. But they also threw it a lot at Marshall. Like like they had, I, I think his number of attempts that he had at Marshall last year would have been Virginia Tech's record for attempts in an entire season. Yeah. So. Uh, they throw the ball a lot, so his his actual interception rate is is not nearly as high as the total number makes it out. Like his interception rate was lower than Jason Brown's was at South Carolina. Yeah. Now Brown threw six, only threw six picks, but he only attempted like a hundred passes. Yeah, it's interesting. At one stretch uh, last year at Marshall, there's a five game stretch where he, these are the attempts he had. 47, 39, 33, 47, 46. And, you know, he, he threw maybe six interceptions in there. That's That's got to be 200, 250 at, at, mm-hmm. attempts in just five games. Well, not five. You know, you know what I'm saying? That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully as the he gets more familiarity with those receivers, hopefully the interceptions cut down a little bit more. And, again, the last one, you have to throw it up, and yeah. it was a jump ball. It happens. So we'll give him credit for two of those. The other two, maybe yeah. Holston yeah. takes one and just the game of football. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. And here's the <laughs> thing, man. There's a reason, like, what was that, third and 16? It was third and long, yeah. Yes. People and don't want to hear this. And that We're on a draw. They did at one point, and the, they did run a QB draw at one point on, like, a third and 12. Right. They didn't pick it up. Right, but. right. Just, just – Make them drive the length of the field. Right. You know? Kishon King, or Kishon King's having a good game at that point. Maybe maybe he gets you in field goal range. Maybe he breaks yeah. it. But, like, considering the success the passing game had had up to that point, you're very unlikely to pick up that first down. I know that people don't want to hear this next part either, predicted outcomes. If you just look at how that game had gone, you were not likely to pick up that first down through the air. So just play, play the safe play, punt right. it, and make them drive right. 80 or 90 yards. Right. I know everybody wants to be aggressive and everything, but, like, we've had the stats before. Per, from a percentage standpoint, on third and long, you are more likely to pick up a first down by running the football because the defense is laid back defending the pass. Yeah. 
It's true. When Chris told me that, I was like, you're kidding me, really? <laughs> well, it, en- it ended up being less of a big deal because they got the unsportsmanlike conduct penalty right. and pushed them back to the 25. But yes, uh, big play in the game. Uh, speaking of penalties, we're going to dive into that next. But first, I want to check in with Katie in the fourth chair for the first time. Disclosure, my voice is shot from yelling at my TV this weekend for obvious reasons. <laughs> Um, but the college football playoff announced that they were expanding to 12 teams in as early as 2026, possibly 2024. I think it will be 2024 after certain discussions are had. But I um, want to hear like any of y'all's takes on this. Honestly, personally, I think that it's a good decision. I think we'll see a lot less opt outs because 12 teams have something to play for versus just four. And so, th- you know, that's not impressive to NFL GMs if you opt out, if you make a 12 team playoff, in my opinion. Um but I think, I don't know if I would have jumped to 12 teams at first. I think that they could have eased into it and gone to eight probably before taking a big leap at 12. But And then just another reason, as a college football fan, we get more games, and that's always fun. So more games, uh, for sure. I think they'll eventually settle at 16. Wow. Um, but because, I, you know, I think after a few years, people will be complaining about, oh, this team, these teams have buys. They yeah. get an extra game or extra week off, everything like that. But uh, I think they'll eventually settle at 16. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. Here's the thing. Like, the, the fact that the playoff exists in its current format has already killed interest in most bowl games. Yep. Anyway. So either go back to the way it was before or move forward with an actual – playoff multiple team you know playoff deal um so yeah i'm fine with it um <laughs> i uh I, I hope we're able to take part in it one day but <laughs> so, well, uh, it's, uh, i'm uh, not gonna make that prediction this week <laughs> I, I, at, at first glance i didn't spend a lot of time thinking about this but at first glance i like <clears throat> the format that they're picking the tops the top six ranked conference champions not the power five champions and then people after that. So if you have a good year in the Sun Belt or you have a good year in the AAC and you wind up ranked ahead of the ACC, you know, yeah. champion, uh, you got a chance to get in and then six at larges and we all know where those are going to go, you know? <laughs> so, okay. Gotcha. Well, I, my first thought was, I love it. I, I mean, more games get, again, gives, other teams a chance to get in there, but then I saw Georgia beat number eleven Oregon forty nine yep. to three on a neutral site, and it's not going to change what happens. At it, the exactly, top, it's know. going. It's those first round matchups when it's the I guess four teams were yeah four teams would get a bye. So when it's the five seed playing the twelve seed, it's probably going to be a blowout. You, you just hopefully the money gets spread around a little bit more and. You, you sit back and you hope that whenever Saban retires, that that creates a little more parity. Yeah. Or or it just becomes the Georgia show. Yeah, but of course Saban just signed a lengthy contract. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. And, and the thing is, he does he doesn't look like he's getting older. It, like, is, he's is he's he always looked an act. Isn't he in his 70s? Yeah, I think, I think he has to be. Him, yeah, and, him mean, and Belichick are the two he, that are way older than you would think. He's all he's always looked and acted about 10 years younger than, than he actually least, was. Yeah. So he's got some time left. Well, we're looking forward to that college football playoff expansion. We're hoping uh, may, maybe the Hokies are putting themselves in contention by the time that goes into effect. We've talked about the turnovers. Let's talk about the penalties. We've alluded to it. 15 penalties for 106 yards for the Hokies. That puts you in a, in a big hole. And a lot of them were procedural issues, illegal mm-hmm. shifts, illegal formation, couple false of start, delay games. couple of delay games, including one on the defensive line uh, for shifting and forcing the offensive line to move. Which so, so somebody asked in the chat about that. That was specifically called on Dax. And the replay didn't show anything. And, of course, the announcers, you know, I, does anybody know anything about that? Why were there Sunbelt officials for a Sunbelt home game? <laughs> because ACC. Well, it, in the West Virginia pit game on Thursday, I remember they called the same thing. The The defensive line kind of mimicked the moves of the play starting. They didn't cross into the neutral zone. So it wouldn't be a neutral zone infraction, but they made the offensive is line move. Is that where we are now? Well, so they called it a delay of game. No, you, you know, every year they have – things that the NCAA tells officials, hey, we want you to focus on points this of year. emphasis. Po- yes. points of, I don't know what the, their points of emphasis was this year, but maybe that was one of them. And it's always a point of emphasis for the first two or three weeks and everybody forgets about it. Right. And then they come up with a different point of em- points of emphasis the next year. Um, I don't know. It was, it was an undisciplined game. Not, not like I will say, I, you know, I guess calls like that are borderline and can go either way. That one pass interference call was dreadful. 
Like the one that was way out of bounds. Oh my god! Yeah. They, they showed the replay, a sideline replay, um, like at the height of the players, and you couldn't see the ball. Eventually, you saw it land about two yards outside of that that white line that's about five yards off the sideline. I mean, you would you would have needed to be like an Olympic pole vaulter to so catch that, that. That actually happened in front of me. It's one of the few plays <laughs> that happened in front of me. And TV didn't do it justice. That ball was way out of bounds. Yeah. And the other thing that struck me was, you know, the I don't remember who our defender was on that play. He mauled the receiver. Well, you know, there it was a, it didn't look that bad on team. They, they kind of got their legs tied up, right. you know. So, so there was a lot of contact. But what struck me being in the stadium was there was no discussion. Nobody ran up and said, "You sure about that? That ball?" Yeah, same here. Like no, I, like I, boom, I, boom, boom, I saw the flag come out, and I'm like, one of those other officials is going to overrule that. Nope. I mean, you're telling me all, none of those guys can look at that and say, "Yeah, they couldn't catch that." Three they flags even, came in. I, I know they so, threw three officials right. threw a flag. <sighs> I don't even know, like that. Like okay, so there's always something you send in every week and say to the refs and say, "Was this?" the right call. I, I don't guess you can do it this week because they weren't ACC refs. Yeah. But uh, I remember Fuente did it uh, in the Notre Dame game in 2019, uh, the late hit on the quarterback. That was the play Virginia Tech sent into the ACC refs uh, to the head of officiating that week. And the ACC got back to Virginia Tech and said that was the wrong we call. Wrong. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that, that one was definitely a big one as well. I was talking to Will before we went on about uh, the offensive pass interference call two plays before the snap went over Peter Moore's head. Right. It, they, so they called it on Stephen Gosnell, I believe, on a pick play is, I guess, what they were but, trying but, to yeah, say. He um, was, he was uh, you know, if you watch the replay, kind of looked like he was actively blocking, not just picking. Okay. He did it, but <laughs> I've seen Tech do that so many times, and it doesn't get called. You see teams uh, do it all you'd the time. See, I mean, it's so common. Like, make up your mind. Like, like, sometimes they throw the flag, sometimes they don't. I would say 80% of the time when that happens, they don't throw the flag. So you don't really know what to expect. Um, teams, it's just so frequent with, with, with teams doing that these days. I mean, I was watching the Notre Dame Ohio state game the other night and I saw it, people do it in that game and they didn't call it. Yeah. That's actually, if, if there's one thing I, I would change in college football is, is I would tell the officials, all right, this is a point of emphasis because I don't think you should be allowed to do that as an offensive player. I agree. Um, and so, so from that standpoint, I do think that was the right call against Virginia tech. My problem with it was, is everybody does it. Tech, I, I mean, we've done it so many times. I've seen and it tech benefit from it many absolutely. times without Ab it being called. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's just, it's one of those things that's part of the game. The, it's like technically, let's say there's a running back or a quarterback and he's pushing forward for extra extra yardage. Technically, offensive linemen and other players aren't supposed to get behind it and push the pile forward. I think they actually changed that rule. Oh, did they really yeah, change it? Yeah. Okay. okay yeah. So you can do it now? Yep. Okay. They, they, they used to. Uh, they it used to be you couldn't do it. You can't and, do it. And that was and, the bush push. Right. Um, right. Right. And every now and then, you know, somebody would uh, get called for it, and you were like, okay, like like you, something needs to change. Either you enforce the rule that you're not enforcing, or you change the rule. Yeah. So they need to do one of the others. They they need they, they need either need to say, okay, yeah, you can start doing that, so everybody knows you can do it, or they need to call it every single time because that's that's actually an easy call to make. If yeah. You, if you're looking at it. it to me, it's, it seems like uh, seems like it would be an easy call to make, but I don't know. So I, I didn't have a problem with the call per se because I don't think plays like that should be allowed to happen, but I have a problem with the fact that that happens so much in college football and most of the time it goes unflagged. Yeah. Just, just be consistent with it, I right. guess, is, is the main thing. But that was a big turning point in the game. Would have put Tech first and goal first to and three. Goal to three yep. uh, instead, it was, I want to say, third and three. 25 or something like that. Yeah, so, so, so you so you could be talking about a 14-point a swing there instead of yeah, a 10-point Yeah, instead point of 10 swing. points instead. Okay, so last thing I want to get to with the bad from Friday night uh, is that last drive of the game uh, defensively for ODU. Obviously, the defense was good almost the entire time, but a couple plays there. Ali Jennings with his two long plays down the near, the near sideline, and then the fourth down and one running back, Stocked up in the backfield and then escapes, sneaks through and gets the first down. So oh. I, I tried to watch that play and uh, and he started out to the running back started out to the left and two tech players just blew up that side of the offensive line and I, and I couldn't couldn't identify them who they were, um, and then it was just and who filled the hole and missed the tackle. Um, 
Let's let's not hang anybody out to dry yeah, if we're not sure. I don't not one hundred percent sure. But yeah, they had their chances, and and uh, again, that's they they needed one yard and they got two when it should have been like a three or four yard loss. Yep, yep. And then the we've mentioned the Dorian Strong, the one catch he allowed was down to the one. Yeah, sure. uh, let's talk clock management here. A lot of people have been talking about after that play happened, or excuse me, right before that uh, that first touchdown that got called back, the clock started rolling after an injury timeout for Old Dominion, and I'm not sure if anybody noticed it. Yeah, well, I think it's because they uh, declined the penalty, right? If they if they, they had declined ex- the penalty, if yeah. they had accepted the penalty, the clock wouldn't have yes. started running. I, yeah. I think is that rule. Um, I I can forget that that's kind of a subtle thing. Like, yeah, you need to know somebody over there on the sideline needs to know that rule. But at the same time, I could it, it's subtle enough where I'm forgiving as far as not not knowing the rule. Now, with that whole army of new staff where they invested, what, about three or four extra million dollars and just extra assistance and extra people. support staff, just more people, you would think for that multi-million dollar investment, somebody over there would notice that 28 seconds is running off the clock. You think you'd, you'd notice after about five or 10 seconds, oh my gosh, the clock's running. So, so for the record, the, the, the clock ran from 109 to 41 seconds yes. right. before Tech called a timeout, so it's 28 seconds. Like s- Somebody's got to notice that. And, you know, it's it's a different animal because Pry is calling the plays defensively, so he's thinking about what he's going to do next on defense. Mm-hmm. And most head coaches don't call plays, so it's a different situation. <laughs> and the other thing I have to say about that is that <clears throat> we as fans sit there and watch a game and – and I do this watching it on TV all the time. The play ends and we stare at the clock. And that's all we think about. Yep. And so it's easy, in air quotes, mm-hmm. for, for fans to manage the clock when they're just watching on television. And, you know, the, the, the sideline is controlled chaos. There's so much going on. Mm-hmm. So, but this is something that, that clearly Brent Pry has to evaluate. You put things in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, some coaches have that get back guy that grabs their belt. Maybe Pry needs to have a clock guy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> taps him on the shoulder. If he, if he's going to call defensive plays, then he, it's really hard to be calling the next defensive play and thinking ahead about scenarios. Uh, you, you know, like oh my gosh, if we force in a punt here, do I, do I want to go after the block or do a punt return? What's my strategy? It's a lot to think. You about. can't do that and watch the clock at the same time. Uh, and maybe he realizes that after his first game as a head coach and maybe somebody from that army of staff that's on the sideline, most of them doing nothing during a game, quite frankly. Maybe that's their assignment now. It's like, okay, you stand next to me, and if the clock's running and in a situation like that, you need to be jerking with my arm and saying, look, man, you, you need to hey, get a time out here. The clock is running. Yeah. Um, and so the other thing I, <clears throat> I think played into some of that stuff was the TV announcers kept saying Tyler Bowen's never called plays before in his career. If you look at his resume, it's offensive coordinator a, a few times. Well, yeah. and he, he, he was the offensive coordinator and play caller for Penn State in a bowl game. In a bowl game, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, against uh, Memphis, I believe. He scored 53 points in that game. Yeah, and prize defense gave up like 40. It was an <laughs> odd game. <laughs> so I wondered about, you know, uh, I don't remember all of the uh, delay of games, you know, where the, the clock. You know, when people are doing stuff for the first time, they got to figure it out. And and I can't remember if I said this in our preview or, or anything like that, but I was on uh, uh, Big Dog Sports Talk with Rick, Rick Watson Friday morning. Yes, I woke up early for Rick and, you know, talked to him at like <laughs> 730 in the morning, even though I didn't want to be awake. And, and he, you know, he asked for my prediction. I said that. And I said, you know, the one thing that concerns me is that this is an ODU team that has some experience. They've been with this coach now for three years, even yep. though they didn't play one of those years. Um, and this is the first time Tech's going into battle with this particular group of players, this particular group of coaches, a lot of which don't have a lot of experience. And I said, that's the one thing that worries me is that, that that'll bite Tech a little bit. And, and I, think it, I think it did. I think, definitely think so. Um, I didn't expect everything to like go perfectly. You, you never right. expect that, especially in a first game. And I'm not necessarily talking about, oh, we're going to get penalties or we're going to have turnovers. I'm talking about just the the smoothness of the operation. Yeah. Like you can't you can you can scrimmage it all you want, but but you can never simulate the an actual game. So I wasn't expecting 100% efficiency there, but it didn't need to be. All Tech had to do was be <laughs> average and they would have won that game that is fairly handily. That's correct. All right, well before we take our break and move over to some more fun topics in the second half, 
Got to ask you a question just in general, two days removed from the loss. Is there any concern following that first game, maybe for the rest of the season or long term after seeing Brent Pry's first uh, game as the head coach? I don't know, because, you know, all of those problems are correctable. Like, uh, well, most of them. Like, like, you can't control how fast your wide receivers and quarterbacks are going to develop that, you, you know, togetherness out there. You can't control wide receiver injuries. You can control penalties for the most part. Um, you can control fair catching punts. Um, things like that. So th- th- those are things that can immediately get better next week. Yeah. Absolutely immediately get better. You know, or maybe that's who we'll be under Brent Pry. That would be not so good if that turns out to be the case. But, like, one game isn't enough to judge that yep. either way. Is that going to be common? Or are we going to look back and say, wow, that was a, a rare, rare occurrence in the Brent Pry era? We just don't know yet. I uh, I feel bad for the fans uh, because you spend all off. Everybody's excited when you get a new coach and everything like that. And there's always a tendency – when you fire the old coach because he didn't win enough games to say, okay, we're going to be better now because because we fired our coach. And the reality is the vast, vast majority of coaches out there, they all have strengths and they all have weaknesses. Um, I think I, I've, I really liked the physicality of which tech played defense the other night. I think they really tried to play with a physical attitude up front and, um, Tackling itself wasn't wasn't great at times, but is but like Nasir Peoples is a way different football player than he was last yeah, year with, with, yeah. with his ability to tackle. I mean, I think the willingness to play physical football was outstanding on the defensive side of the ball, and I don't think that was the case last year under the old staff. Flip it in reverse. I think Justin Fuente clock management would have won that game. So that was Justin Fuente's strength. Maybe it's not Brent Price. Well, he right. wasn't calling plays. Except, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. You know, so uh, I, we're, it's going to take a while. <laughs> Maybe you should have been calling I'm, plays. I, it's it's, it's, it's going to take a while uh, to uh, to figure out whether that actually is a weakness for Pry. Yeah. So my, my concerns are the injuries. Yes. Um, and, and then the the vague, nonspecific uh and Chris and I are both starting to develop this opinion that uh, there's been too much losing and it's starting to get ingrained and somebody needs to step up and make a play. Um, and guys had opportunities at the end of the game. You know, you keep the game close and then at the end you got to make plays. And I watched college football all weekend and there were guys making plays all over the place. Um, there, there were three touchdowns in the last 30 seconds of, of UNC and Appalachian State. <laughs> And there were some, and you watched that LSU FSU game last night. That was insane. Yeah, guys making plays all over the field. Not all of them were good, (laughs) (laughs) and we don't want to make those kind of plays. But um, that stuff is 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 hard to turn around, and you really need you need a dude. And I remember uh, after Brian Randall's career was over, I did a series of interviews with him, and you know Brian had been an okay quarterback. And then he was, after a certain point in his senior year, he was a really good quarterback. And he was praised for his leadership and all that. He was really great at it. And I remember talking to him and saying, you know, you can talk all you want when you're a leader, but eventually you just got to make plays. He said, absolutely. He said, what really changed was, you know, I started making plays. I wasn't just talking about stuff and, and being a good guy in the locker room and that kind of thing. So Tech needs those guys – and I, and I think there's a tendency of the fans to say that, that those guys don't exist on this team. We don't know that. Yep. Um, I, I, one of the things uh, that somebody reminded me of was Brian Randall's senior year, he threw a hideous interception for a touchdown against West Virginia. West Virginia. And I don't remember who was sitting next to me. It wasn't one of my friends. I think it was a TSL. And I turned to him and said, I guess he'll never be a good college quarterback. <laughs> And he was <laughs> ACC play that season. He was he became a very good college quarterback. So don't say that those guys don't exist on this team. Um, they didn't exist Friday night. They're they're not there yet. They can be. Yeah. Maybe Dorian Strong makes that play later. Maybe he makes a. Was it Jermaine Waller that picked off the pass at the end of the ODU game last year? 
That's a great play. That was, was West Virginia. Did what I say? Oh, do you? I meant West Virginia. <laughs> um, and Notre and Jermaine, Jermaine Waller made play after play at the early in the season. season. Yeah, before yeah, he got hurt, you know. And then uh, so so yeah. So that's the other thing that worries me is is the is the looking around going who's going to make a play and so far the answer is is just in one game nobody. Well, Dax is regarded as you know the defensive leader from a spokesman standpoint. He's been in the program the longest is the most likely to step up and say something, but he's never been one of those high graders. Yeah. You know, he's, he's had his career grades on PFF at least have been very average. Well, he had the best game of his career from a grade standpoint on Friday night. And from the eye test standpoint, it was very good. Yes. 90.5, uh, particularly dominant against the pass. In coverage. in coverage. And he was uh, like 31 plays in coverage. It wasn't like he built that grade off of five plays. For, for, for all for every linebacker in the country who played a minimum 40 snaps this past year, he was the third highest grader in the entire country. Past weekend. Right. So, to me, like, Dax earned the right to say whatever he wants to say this week. <laughs> and I did see him get on Jaden McDonald uh, on one play. McDonald lost containment and... and ODU picked up a first down, and Dax looked at him and barked at him. That's a whole interesting thing right there. Is Jaden McDonald uh, yeah, McDonald starting at, at the Will linebacker spot? Uh, I, I like both McDonalds, but I thought it was interesting that the staff just hyped up Jaden Keller like crazy in the offseason. And they listed an or, or, or situation on the depth chart this week, but they had Jaden Keller first. They had Jaden Keller first, McDonald second, Tisdale third. As it turns out, Tisdale didn't even make the trip for whatever reason. Wow. And they ended up starting McDonald. And, I, and so despite and Keller d- played d- 15, 15 snap. snaps, I don't think he played at all on defense in the first half. So I don't know if there was some kind of a dis- makes you wonder, discipline yeah. thing yeah. that you don't know about. But as soon as he came on in the second half, that got that sack and, and the fumble. Punch the football right, out. Right, exactly. And uh, But then they took him out after that again. Yeah. Uh, and Mc, McDonald was a little bit lost. I mean, he's a redshirt freshman. Yeah. And he, he's not as advanced as, as Keller at the stage. I think he's got a chance to be a very good player for Tech, but he wasn't quite ready. So to me, that was interesting that, that you spend the summer hyping one guy and then you don't start him. You pick the other redshirt yeah. freshman who you hardly talked about at all in the preseason and you start him instead. Is there something going on there? Like I'm all for like player privacy and things like that, but when you hype one guy up and then you don't play him and it, it makes you wonder about the whole thought process. It's same with, same with offensive line, Braylon Moore. I mean, Pryle came out and said, I anticipate Braylon Moore helping us in game one. And he didn't play at all. Didn't did play one snap. Yeah. On offense so, or special team. So interesting stuff. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, so, like I said, man, everybody wants more media access and things like that. Part of this is, like, you throw coaches in front of the media and they keep getting asked, asked questions and questions and questions. And you got to say something, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And you want to talk your kids up and make you, them feel you, good. You do, you do. You do. So he might have to, like, temper a little bit how he uh, – how he talks. I don't. I don't know how much of an open media policy Penn State had as far as how much the defensive coordinator talked to the media. Um, but I, I would guess that he talked to the media more in the preseason this year at Tech than he ever had in his in entire the, career. <laughs> yeah, in Penn State. yeah, yeah. So he might have some learning to do there. But um, I, I think as the season goes on, you will see more get some snaps. Um, but the, although the issue wasn't really offensive guard the other night, it was uh, perimeter. It was, yeah, it was uh, Parker Clements, after having a really good freshman season, I thought had the worst game of his career. Really? Yep. And the PFF grades indicate that as well. He was bad in pass blocking and run blocking. Silas Jansey had a very good game. Uh, Caden Moore was okay. Not as good as he, well, not as good as he could have been, but, but okay. Uh, Jesse Hansen did okay for his first start. Johnny Jordan, again, did not have a good game. Mm-hmm. So it's two of the five offensive linemen that were subpar. In Clements' case, very subpar. And all three tight ends were horrible in run blocking. Like, the, the tight end run blocking was uh, just as big a culprit as offensive line play. Now, to the receiver's credit, uh, two of the th- – all right, so let's see. Oh, let me go ahead and get to this part right now. Only three players on the entire offense had a run blocking grade higher than 60.5, which is basically, which is your baseline Only three average. players on the entire, the entire offense. offense. Wow. Janzy – Gosno and Lofton, so two of the and two of those two were wide receivers. receivers. So like, almost everybody on the inside, with the exception of Janzi, c- 
couldn't block anybody all night. The tight ends were particularly bad. I mean, all three of them. I'm talking like blocking grades in the 40s, like like F on wow. a, on a on a AF scale. I mean, that is an F. That was bad. Mm-hmm. So, Kashawn King has actually played such a good game. He's tied for 21st in the country with forced missed tackles with eight. And nine of the running backs ahead of him have played two games. Wow. Okay. So everything he did, he did on his own. Makes wow. it even more impressive, the game he had. And I think that's what we're going to start with when we get into the the bright spots from the game is how good he was and kind of the tandem he could make when Malachi Thomas comes back. But first, we're going to take our break. But before we do that, I want to check in with Katie one more time. Uh, we've mentioned the Florida State game a couple of times. I was going to say, I'm just wearing my ACC sweatshirt proudly today. Because <laughs> with the exception of Virginia Tech and a couple other teams, the conference did have a pretty impressive weekend of football. Obviously, it started Thursday with the Pitt and West Virginia game. That was a good win for Pitt. They had a really good atmosphere there. Um, everyone was tuned into that game. Although they were supposed to have a really good defense this year, their defense didn't look all that good. No. They did get a win, though. And last night, obviously, I didn't expect that performance from Florida State. And... I'm glad that they're not on our schedule this year, but they are next year. I remember that we travel to Tallahassee next year. So if Jordan Travis is still there, I think he still has eligibility. That might be a tough one. And then, you know, Miami puts up 70 and Clemson should handle business tonight. So it's nice to not have Clemson carrying the conference in week one, at least. At least there was a, a good win. Now, we'll see. Like, uh, we thought it was a good win when Virginia Tech beat Florida State that year in the opening game. Yes. I don't know about LSU. I think that guy, as they had as head coach, was a complete clown show. I I think he's run them right into the ground, and they're about to find out how bad he was. Interesting. Um, I mean, I think he he rode the the coattails of one of the best quarterbacks or one of the best players in college football history to the national title that year. And but you saw how bad they were last year. There's no way LSU should should lose that much. I mean, that guy just you look at his record when he was the Ole Miss head coach. He was terrible. And yeah. outside of the one year where he had one of the best players in school in college football history, he he did way less with more at LSU. And I think he's pretty much run them into the ground. And I think Brian Kelly, he's got a tougher job than people realize. So, Katie, you mentioned the ACC, and the, this this tweet caught my eye over the weekend from Kelly. I believe her last name is, pr- is pronounced Gramlich. Yeah. Um, she works for ESPN and the ACC Network, and uh, she tweeted out, Road games at group of five schools during week one or week zero. The ACC had three of them. Tech at ODU, NC State at ECU, UNC at App State. Big 12, zero. Big 10, zero. Pac-12, one. Arizona went to San Diego State. SEC, one. And that was week zero, Vandy at Hawaii. (laughs) And uh, so you look at what happened with Georgia and Oregon. I do not know why schools keep saying, yes, I'll play in the Georgia Dome against an SEC team. (sighs) Stupid. They're number 11 in the country. Well, they don't know when they schedule the game. They're going to be number 11 in the country. But, you know, and and I get that there's counter arguments to to be the best. You got to beat the best. But why do teams go into the Georgia Dome against SEC teams? We've been there. Why are we playing South Carolina in the Georgia Dome? We might be better in Charlotte. Why not in Charlotte? Exactly. Why is it all the way in the Georgia Dome? Why do our fans have to travel? Why do our fans from Northern Virginia have to travel? What will it be, eight hours, nine hours for them to get down there? And the South Carolina fans have to go like two or three Why hours. did Florida State go to New Orleans to play LSU? Why? Well, it was just stupid. Yeah, it's real. I mean, yeah. now, now, they got a – they they had a good contingent there. Now, Florida State is in West in there, Florida, Yeah, you're right. To They're a certain close. extent. Yeah, but, but, but yeah, it seems to me like some of a lot of these teams are tying themselves into deals where uh, – it just don't make a lot of sense from a scheduling standpoint. And I'm not even talking about Tech's road games. Uh, like I understand the financial aspects of it, of how like SEC teams are increasing the cost of buy games. Like it's nothing for the SEC to throw out a million bucks to some scrub team to come in and take their L and then leave. And, and for Virginia, Virginia Tech, Tech another, we can't afford yeah, that. Can't afford that. Right. So you end up with these home two and for home one, deals, two with, for ones, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it was almost a really big go ACC weekend. Obviously, Tech lost, but I mean, it could have easily been UNC and NC State losing on the road. Yeah. Can you imagine all three of those big ACC Power Five schools losing to the smaller, to the smaller schools? And it could have just as easily, like, like yeah, Tech could have taken, should have taken care of business. 
but but like at the same time we didn't get the luck with the bounce obviously and NC State got the luck right NC State got the luck yep and yeah the whole lace is out thing and their field goal <laughs> kicker misses the I mean, extra, extra point extra point and a, and a field goal and obviously UNC when you give up 40 points in a quarter <laughs> and then your head coach is dancing in the locker room afterwards like you did something impressive. That guy's so out of touch. Situational awareness. Well, the other uh, big, I guess, upset loss uh, for the ACC was this week's opponent, Boston College, lost to Rutgers. They, are, uh, they, they had 28 carries for 29 yards. BC did? Yes. So as expected, they're an offense with two players. I'll tell you and what, and, and the other flip, the other side of that is I didn't watch that game until Rutgers game winning drive, and I believe it was 96 yards, and they just ran the football. They just pounded it down Boston College's throat. Now, Rutgers running back, I thought, was a stocky, physical guy. You know, I'd, I'd take him on my team having just watched that one drive, but that's interesting. Yeah, so. BC, I mean, well, they were picked next to last in the Atlantic. Right. You're getting all this, Katie. You're going to be previewing it on Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm literally uh, taking notes right now to talk that, about that, it. <laughs> that, the last drive was surprising because BC's got some experienced guys on defense, names that Tech fans will recognize. It seems like some of those BC guys are there for forever. They're uh, good at player the retention, them yeah. and Pitt. Um, but, but you know, on offense, it's it's the Dracovic, Zay, Zay Flowers, Flowers show, and that's it. Yeah. And be, they're off. The, I think they had to replace all five starters on the offensive line, so they they couldn't block the other day. And they don't have a they don't have a running back. Uh, it's not your traditional BC team. Um, so I kind of think that game's going to be a rock fight. But we'll talk about that on Wednesday. Yeah, yeah Wednesday. Well, there's a tease for Wednesday's preview podcast. Uh, two teams, both coming off tough losses, wanting to bounce back uh, Saturday night in Lane Stadium. Let's take our break here on episode 252 of the Tech Sideline podcast. We've gone through the bad stuff. When we come back, we're going to look at the bright spots and what there kind of is to look forward to coming up this week against Boston College. That's coming up on the other side of this break on episode 252 of the Tech Sideline podcast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to episode 252 of the Tech Sideline podcast. We're recapping Virginia Tech's loss to Old Dominion back on Friday night to start off the 2022 season. A reminder, if you are in the YouTube chat, please be sure to drop a comment or question for Will and Chris. We'll get to those at the end of the show. A reminder, Tech Sideline is brought to you by First Bank and Trust. We've gone through all the bad guys. Let's talk about some of the good from Friday night. And I mentioned we're going to start with Keyshawn King. With no Malachi Thomas and a very limited Jalen Holston on Friday night, it was his show for pretty much the entire game. And he was sensational. Uh, Really looked a lot more physical than we've seen him uh, in previous years. Breaking tackles, really getting his nose in there. And and he really helped that offense move the ball when they couldn't uh, through the passing game. So what was a broken tackle stat again? Because uh, uh, let's we'll go over that since we're talking he, about he he forced eight missed tackles, which is twenty uh, first in the country uh, out of all running backs with ten plus carries. Nine of the backs in front of him have actually played in two games rather than one. So this so, is the, the number. Yeah. So he and I think he's something like eighth or ninth on elusive rate, which uh, again for backs with ten plus carries. And I think there was 149 or 150 backs with 10 plus carries or players mm-hmm. with 10 plus carries. And he's number nine in elusive rate. An elusive rate measures how many yards a running back gains on his own without help from blocking, which was most of his yards. The other 
Yeah. Um, I think that's the best I've ever seen him look. No um, question. Uh, Way yeah. more physical. Yeah. Even the pass block. He lift that on, dude on, so on Grant Ball's first interception. Yes. His pass blocking grade is like a it's a it horror. Is. It's like a nineteen, no, no, and no, it includes I've, that awesome I've, block. I've, I've found through the years that like pass blocking is uh, like the last thing to get graded okay. accurately yeah, on, so on PFF. So I'm not sure that's going to turn that was out a to hell be block, It was, yeah. Um, but that, that's the most physical he's played his career by yeah. far. Now, what you got to wonder about is that was 19 carries, right? Um, he's listed 180 pounds, you know. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure you're going to be able to get that from him every game. Of course, season is a long season. You don't want to get it from no. for every game. Uh, you want what, other guys. What, what, to... what, do we, what do we talk about last week? I said the the biggest concern about no Malachi Thomas and the possibility of no Jalen Holston, which we barely got any Jalen Holston, yeah. only five carries and, and a drop pass, um, was that. That means more Kashawn King at traditional running back, which means they can't use him on the outside like we want to, which means less playmaking talent on the outside of wide receiver. Bam, what did we see the other night? Yeah. Without him out, outside, there wasn't nearly as much of a, of a playmaking threat. Um, I think he did a great job. Uh, I'd like to get him on in space more. Um, he's going to find those broken tackles harder to come by against a much bigger and much more physical defense with with boston college and and, and teams like that um but again i i think Kashawn king and the defense displayed what i hope is a more physical attitude by virginia tech football going forward that those because i thought the defense played more physical than they had played in a long time and i thought Kashawn king played more physical than he'd ever played the surprising part was was uh the lack of physicality from like the tight ends and, and most of the offensive line in, in the run game. But you saw that willingness to be physical at, at most of the other positions. So I'm happy about that. That's one thing to be happy about. And Keyshawn King, you feel like he can be that compliment to Malachi Thomas when he comes back. Hokies running running game in the backfield should be in a pretty good spot once Malachi Thomas starts to get healthy. Yeah, we don't know when that's going to happen, though. Uh, I don't anticipate it being this week. And whenever it does happen, it's going to take him a, a while to get back up to speed. Yeah. I mean, he hasn't had contact since, I mean, I, I guess he took part in maybe like one contact practice this 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 offseason or this preseason and then got hurt. <laughs> so he basically hasn't had contact since the next to last week of spring practice. So he's out of football shape. Is, uh, is, uh, man, I'm not talking about like conditioning. Yeah, as far game as shape is different. Game than shape, just like, like getting tackled, getting up, and boom, going into the next play without feeling anything. Uh, that takes a while, and yeah. ideally, that 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 type of fitness is built up over a preseason. So, I don't know that we're going to see the real Malachi Thomas till later in the year. Yep, I agree with that. I'm, I'm, you know, and again, this is not off of any inside info or anything like that. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I don't think we'll see him in September. That's that's kind of where my brain is right now. Well, Keyshawn King hopefully can continue his success and at least give the Hokies uh, a stand-in for Malachi Thomas until he gets healthy. Elsewhere on the offense, we mentioned we were impressed by Dwayne Lofton at times at wide receiver. I thought he played a pretty solid game yeah. overall. Uh, and I also wrote down Nick Gallo. You mentioned the tight end blocking grades weren't good, but, but he, he did well in the passing. He game. flashed in the passing game yeah. more than he did last season. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I I kind of expected that and. Uh, you know, I think he is a good receiving tight end, maybe not a flashy receiving tight end. But uh, Dax told me in July at ACC kickoff that he was like, Gallo's going to be involved a, a lot this year, so watch out. And I thought, what did he catch, seven passes? Some, something close to that. I'm not exactly sure the number. But he had, he'd call 15 if only we had somebody with a computer. <laughs> yeah, if only we had someone with one of those. I, I want to say he only had 14 catches last season, okay. despite James Mitchell being out for right all but two games. Right. So... Gallo, clearly, they want to get him involved more. I, I know yeah. he only had 130 yards last season. And, as and, a and that was one of the things Wells was good at. He was good at checking down yep. to Gallo. And a few of those, he was the initial read, I think. But but several others, he was not. Um, so, you yeah, you like to see your tight end catch passes. But at the same time, if he catches too many, it probably means the wide receivers aren't getting open <laughs> and you're checking down to the tight end. Which was the case at times. A lot of little throws out to the flat for Nick Gallo. So, so next game, I want to see Lofton catch seven, and I want to see Gallo catch three. Perfect. That'll work. Um, <laughs> and I, I just think I just think Wells is going to play a lot better. I yes. Mean, he's, 
Uh, and then, th- you know, there's not really anything you can say to expand upon that. I, 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 I hope and I think at the end of the year we'll be going, man, I'm glad he got over that. He's He's got to get help from a supporting cast. I think my original comment about Wells is I'm not worried about him, but I'm worried about the people he's throwing to. Yeah. And the grades from his first game bear that out. Yeah. And I think Wells, you, you could see the talent for the most sure. part. You could see that he can be a good quarterback. It just didn't. He wasn't consistent throughout the game. Kind of a roller coaster type game right. for him at times. And you got to stick with him. Um, you got to stick with him. He's, the, I think, he's the most talented quarterback, and he has multiple years of eligibility remaining. So, if Virginia Tech is a, a de, can de, if they have good developers of quarterbacks, that he will improve. If Grant Wells doesn't improve between now and the end of his career. That says more about coaching than re, it will re, say about re, re alarm bells. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought, uh, speaking of quarterbacks, I thought Jason Brown looked really engaged. Uh, saw him a lot of times on the sideline, and um, I know he was he was disappointed when when it was officially announced that Grant Wells was the starter. Brown went to social media and expressed his disappointment quite quite profoundly. But did he really? He, he did. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was just you know he acknowledged it on social media. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to misrepresent. It wasn't like he went off, yeah. But but he did say, you know, when you when you're facing adversity, you just got to keep working and all that stuff. Uh, and he looked really uh, engaged on the sideline the other night. And I think that's the advantage of having a veteran backup quarterback. Unlike last year, where it was Knox Kadem who really hadn't done much uh, on the field. Now you've got a guy who's played SEC football can kind of help Grant Wells as he works through some of this stuff. Yeah, and if something happens to Grant Wells, you've got a veteran. Who's been through all the battles, um, but you know, like I'm, I, I would take a real disaster, uh, and I know losing to Old Dominion, kind of, kind of. Uh, now, if Tech had gone out there and played a perfect game from a penalty standpoint and a punt return standpoint, and, no, no turnovers uh, and everything like that, and then Grant Wells had, had still thrown four picks and cost Tech the game, I'd be like, oh man. We got a chance to be good this year, but he just cost us the game. How many more is he going to cost us? But I, don't, I, don't, I didn't come away with from the game with that feeling, simply yeah. because two of them weren't his fault. And quite frankly, if, how many? I mean, he was responsible for both the Tech's touchdowns. It's not yes. like they were. I mean, he like, and he was their third highest grading offensive player. So uh, not ready to pull that play. Not even close to being ready to 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 make a change there because. He's still got a lot of growth potential, yep. and you hired Brett Pry. Twenty two is a twenty twenty two is going to be a part of his tenure, but you hope for a long, successful tenure. And the most important thing for Virginia Tech football right now is the future. Like, so I want I'd like to be a good football team this year, but I don't want to sacrifice twenty three and twenty four. To, to, because I think those teams have higher ceilings than this team. I, I don't want to sacrifice a higher ceiling in the future to have a higher floor this year, yeah. if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and you know, if, if you look at it from that standpoint, it is about, you know, work to get these players used to playing with each other, with each other these coaches used to coaching with each other, get the operation better. And, you know, harsh lesson in week one, clock management. Okay, correct that and move on. And, and uh, it, if it being Bowen's, you know, with Bowen without a lot of play calling experience, um, maybe that did disrupt the operation a little. Plays weren't getting in as fast as they will in the future. So, yeah, keep keep getting better at that stuff and get better for the future. And, again, it's only game one. There were bright spots in a lot of places, but just not enough to get the win. We're going to check on, on the defense next, but first let's check in with Katie again in the fourth chair. Um, it's been talked about on Twitter, on the message boards a lot over the past couple of days, just the status of our series with ODU and the years to come. I mean, what is you all's opinion on if you want to keep that series, if you would want to replace it, who would you replace it with? Because, I mean, the fact of the matter is we go back to Norfolk in 2024, and I don't think that that should happen. Uh, I think I think we should go up there and steamroll them and then cancel the series. I think we look like cowards if we cancel it after yeah. losing to them twice. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm a little jaded because I've been hearing Virginia Tech fans complain about scheduling since the '90s. It's, I mean, nobody's ever happy with it. Is what it is. It folks. is what it is. Uh, what we I mean, we talked about earlier. I mean, these buy games these days, are some some of them are costing over a million bucks because the SEC can outbid everybody, and that's not 
affordable for for Virginia Tech with a smaller TV contract and a stadium that seats anywhere from twenty to forty thousand fewer than most of those SEC stadiums. Is you just it's not nearly as financially feasible. Uh, I think I think if you if you don't if you don't play out your contract, it makes you look bad. And and I think I think we should have beaten them the other night. And I don't know, it, it, just ref, it would reflect poorly if Tech tried to get out of the series after they lost there twice. Take care of business. Play football like Virginia Tech's supposed to play football, and you don't have to worry about ODU beating you. I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't like some of the incidents that happened. I don't like the, the locker room incident afterwards. Uh, Which is, we, we haven't even we talked have, about that. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Uh, I mean, who would I replace them with? I mean, I don't know who who wants to play. I don't know. Well, so here's I, the, here's I, I the thing. I replace them with West Virginia every year. There, there's five Power Five conferences, and they all want G five Group of Five schools to come to their place. Three for ones, two for ones, you know, and and so these G five schools have options. So people are like, how do we wind up in this basically a home on home ten year series with with ODU? Well, the first reason you do it is money, because if you want to if you want to play ODU at home three times and once on the road, then you got to buy the other two. Otherwise, you make it a home and home to where you're basically paying each other and, and, and it's a net zero. Okay, so then then I think to myself, well, you know, Virginia Tech, they make uh, millions of dollars off of each home game. Go ahead and play ODU 800000 or a million to come in here and play. And you still come out ahead. Well, that's assuming ODU would do it. Oh, do you can just turn around and go, no, UVA said they do a home and home and UNC said they come to our place. So, nope. Yeah, because these are the other AC schools are doing that. I mean, NC State's playing at ECU. North Carolina's playing at App State. Um, I mean, you've seen, I think, UNC and NC State play at, at ODU also. So, it's not like Virginia Tech has leverage ODU's here. ODU's got other schools coming in the future. Yeah, right. Yeah. And Liberty, too, who's coming up, everybody says, oh, you're playing two – in-state games on the road against group of five teams. But Liberty, I want to say they've had a they've ton had of schools come in there. Um, uh, Wake, maybe? or I think they have Wake coming up. I think, the, yeah, uh, I think you're right. So it's happening across the ACC. And if it's happening across the ACC, there's probably a reason there for There are that. reasons for uh, it. I think, and I think it has to do with uh, with money uh, more than and stadium size. And, 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 and the fact that those schools are in such close proximity. It's not like the Pac-12 where, like, there's so many schools spread out across the entire Midwest. Like these are all, these are really close trips for, for, for ACC schools and vice versa. I, uh, I mean, there are a few schools. I think it's a shame that the COVID canceled the Penn state series. It was going to be a very good series. Love to play a home and home with Tennessee, but I doubt Tennessee would go for that. Why would they do? I mean, I mean, Jim, Jim Weaver used to talk about, yep, I've tried scheduling, but they don't want to play. Yeah. So you can snap your fingers and get somebody else to play. I mean, they already they I mean, they're already playing Georgia and Florida and, and like like I think they're going to be happy with their easy non-conference schedule and then and then then take on the the SEC. Uh, uh you know, if you what if you could get a two for one with Navy? Um, uh, you know what what if you could get a, a two for one with a Army, see, I I'd li- I think that's a nice setting. See, in here's, Army the and here's the other thing that people they they don't want to hear this either, and they don't get it. These in-state schools want to play each other and support each other. This is stuff that happens at the at the university level and even at the highest levels of athletic administration. There are certain I'm guessing there are certain people that if you cancel the ODU series and start playing Navy instead, that has repercussions throughout the state. You know, people remember that stuff. I'm not playing ODU. We lost to them, and and they stole an iPad from our locker room. Um, I'm not going to play at Liberty because just because we shouldn't be, we're better than them. Well, you know, you're in the same state with them. You can't go around with the attitude, we're better, so we're not coming. Yeah, you know, I mean, you think about it. Like, all the all the board of visitors for all these big in-state schools, they all, they, they all know each other. They're all business partners. These people all do business like with each other. Yeah, you, you know, so there's always top-down pressure. For, from things like that. That uh, your regular fans don't get and don't want to hear about. I, I don't know. I, I, I honestly, this is my honest opinion. I don't think Tech fans will ever be happy with scheduling. Well, that's true. They, they, yeah. they hated the East Carolina series, so we canceled that. 
and they played Old Dominion, and now they hate that. They'll hate Liberty. Right, right, right. They're, they hate Liberty. The bottom line is the main reason they hate it is because we keep losing to those teams. <laughs> It's a good Start point. They, they used to complain about being bored. Now, now it's different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see how it all works out with that scheduling. I, I'm on your side here, Chris. I think you need to go down to Norfolk in 2024. Yeah, take care of business. Win by 30, and then you can say, all right, we're not coming back. Which is what they should have done the other night, which, was, which is what they could have done. Well, let's look back at the defense, which was a reason why they could have done that, uh, because the defense was fantastic. Again, we said the last offensive play for ODU was their only offensive touchdown. Uh, overall, I mentioned this in the first half, but I'll, I'll rehash it. Monarchs had 245 total yards. Hayden Wolf, quarterback, was 14 of 35, 40% throwing the football, and 2.4 yards per carry on the ground. That's going to win you a lot of football games. Yeah, uh, for sure. I, I Like I said, I was impressed with... Uh, the physicality of Virginia Tech's defense. Uh, you know, they missed some tackles. I will say, you know, they were listed with 10 missed tackles on PFF, and uh, McDonald was responsible for 30% of them. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I, I don't know that he's going to continue to start o- over Keller as time goes by. We'll just have to monitor that situation. But to me, the most impressive thing was the willingness to be physical. I thought Tech was very physical, especially on the inside. Uh, Pollard and and Kendricks were absolutely dominant i thought i thought just off the top of my head i don't remember the last time virginia tech played a game where like both starting defensive tackles at the same time were that dominant hmm. and fuga was good too fuga w- w- was was good off the bench so i and with dax right behind them at mike with the highest grade of his career tech's interior defense was awesome they could they could they, could, they can clean some stuff up on the perimeter as far as leverage goes um but on the whole you know you you can't complain about playing a football game where you allow seven points. That's what the defense did. They allowed seven points. And I don't care if it was on the first drive of the game or the last drive of the game. And and did I want them to close it out? Sure. You know, but, but it's, uh, oh, that it should have been, that game should have been closed out mid third quarter. Yeah. To be honest. And they did give up the two field goals, but one of those was on a short field mm-hmm. on an interception. So you, you do look at the defense. They did everything they could except for the one last drive. They needed one more stop and, and couldn't get it done. You mentioned Dax Hollifield. He, he really flashed all over the place. We mentioned the PFF grade's good. The eye test backed it up. That's kind of what you expected him to be his entire career, and it looks like the Brent Price system maybe unlocked that for him. Yeah, uh, maybe. We maybe. There, there, there's going to be greater challenges. Like, uh, like ODU does not have much athleticism on offense outside of Jennings on the outside. Uh, their offensive line, in my opinion, is a mediocre Sunbelt offensive line. So Virginia Tech is going to be – there are greater challenges ahead for, for Dax and all of those, you know, interior defensive players. But it's a good start. It's a good start because when you have a 90.5 preliminary grade and it's the best in your career, I mean, sure – I mean, they're not Miami and, and they're not Clemson and, and or, or NC State or whoever, but he played better against ODU than he had against even FCS opponents. He's played in, a lot of past. bad teams in the last three years. Right, and, right, and, and right. The, his best grade, the only other grade he's had over an 80 was against UNC in 2018, a long time ago. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was so he's had a freshman. Lot, yeah, yeah, and he's had a lot of opportunities, and it was only like 35 snaps. It wasn't right. like he was in there the whole game. Right. Um, so he's had a lot of opportunities against against bad teams, and you know that's that just kind of speaks to the point that that was one of his his best game if you just go by the grades. Mm-hmm. And with the defense early on in the game, it felt like all of the big plays were going against the Hokies. A couple of interceptions, the field goal issue, but the defense stepped up and had some turning point plays. The big fumble forced at the end of the first half, which made sure it was only a three point deficit heading into the locker room. And then Jaden Keller, we talked about it earlier, punching the ball out, set up that that go ahead touchdown for Virginia Tech. It wasn't just that they were stopping them; they were they were creating some momentum they, they swing you know probably 10 points in text directions through those uh e- either uh preventing the late first half field goal and then setting up a touchdown so as far as i'm concerned like the defense basically s- not necessarily scored but they set up more points for virginia tech than they actually allowed so uh it's just very disappointing from that standpoint but it is a good sign for the defense going forward yes i, I thought first game out new scheme um, you know, a, a few new players in there. 
some guys play in different positions. Uh, I thought that was about all. Uh, that was a better performance than I was expecting. I was expecting a good, solid performance, but we got a very good performance. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. And obviously a much bigger test coming up this weekend. Phil Dracovic and Zay Flowers and Boston College coming in. We'll dive into all of that on Wednesday's podcast. Before we get to the YouTube chat, I, I've split this podcast up. First half was the bad, second's the good. This is the other, I guess, is what we can call it. Uh, at halftime, the coach is trying to get back up to the, the box, gets stuck in the elevator, and I did notice on my way up to the press box pregame, there's a sign next to the elevator It says, this elevator is reserved for coaches heading back up to the booth for the, for the last two minutes before halftime ends. And... Somehow they still didn't get up get up there in time. I don't even know how an, how an elevator gets stuck. What does that mean? So I guess it got stuck between floors. and So it's moving and then it just stops? Yeah. That, I've never been in a stuck elevator. I haven't either, so I, I don't know what it's like. No, I will say this. It's going to be easy to make fun of ODU There's, for that. <laughs> probably should, but... You know, I know a former Tech football player who uh, said there was, there was an elevator in... Uh, the Jamerson Center that he got stuck in several times. <laughs> several times. Yeah. That's interesting because so. that's never happened to me. Well, I, I will say that uh, I waited for the elevator for about 15 minutes at one point, and it wouldn't it wouldn't come. And <laughs> Any idea how they get them moving again? I have no idea. Some but grease in there, man. They, they did it. It was only, what, a 10, 15-minute delay? Did you know what was going on in the stands? It, it I was down behind the stands uh, having a conversation with somebody, and it just seemed to me like halftime went on a really long time. <laughs> you know, and and I, I kept kind of going like this. Oh, of course. Not starting. It's the proper way to start a football season with no context college football, and it just shows the camera view of the empty coaching booth, <laughs> and it said second half delay due to Virginia Tech coaches being stuck in an elevator. Yeah. That's how the season starts. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was funny because I had no idea what was going on. They're just standing there, and Brent Price talking to the officials, and we thought – he was, he was pointing at his headset, so we thought maybe they were having comms issues and wanted to figure that out, but nope, just the elevator not working. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we also alluded to uh, some items being taken from the locker room after the game. It just, it was just uh, a crazy r- night. Remember somebody dressed up as janitors and went in there? Is that, yeah. is that what we... That's, that's one thing. Well, that's what some people have heard. I don't know. Uh, who knows? Like uh, Apparently, the entrance to the, t- to the visitor's locker room is near a place that is very accessible by, by fans. Okay. By, and, uh, I'm, I'm guessing like, I'm guessing it was down in that end zone that, yeah. that I was in. Yeah. It was um, in, it's in the corner. Cause that's where there. the tech players yeah. went off the field, but yes. I didn't really watch to see where they went after that. Right. Uh, a buddy of mine was pelting me with texts last night. He says, gotta be an inside job. How does that happen? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, it's it's not like there's a I mean, cadre of armed guards it, down there. You know? It's, it's, it's not. a door. Just which, watch in it. Which could be, a, I mean, we've talked on this podcast about how difficult it is for Virginia Tech to staff their football games these days. Yeah. About how they used to pay locals minimum wage, and now they have to ship in people from out of town and pay them 20 bucks an hour to work at football yeah. games. And they're still understaffed, right? Yeah. And so for a program that had, like ODU that doesn't have nearly as not much money as Virginia Tech, it's entirely possible that they – just don't have a full staff of security guards and things like that. Well, yeah, hopefully all of the the stuff is retrieved and or or they figure something you would out. You think it would be locked? Yes, but yes. Know. So there, there you go. Those were some of the other strange things that went on uh, at SB Ballard Stadium on Friday night. And I think that wraps up our recap of the game. Obviously, it didn't go Thank the way God. everyone <laughs> everyone hoped it would, but hopefully happier things to talk about next Monday. That's that's the goal here. Yeah. Um, let's check in on the YouTube chat. Katie, do we have one or two questions in there? Yeah, we can do one or two. Um, Michael Watson says, with all the wideouts and with all the wideout injuries and Thomas out, could this offense look better and in turn the team look better in the season, even with even with better competition? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, the problem is everybody else is getting better too. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's always a it's a cliche comment by coaches every year that and I haven't heard Brent Price say this yet, but, but I'm sure he'll say <laughs> to that. To his credit, he'll say it at his uh, pre- press conference uh, this week. I'm sure, but all coaches sit there and say uh, teams always improve their best between their their first and second games. Okay, everybody thinks about that in a vacuum with their own team, but every coach says it, so it applies to every team, right? So if Virginia Tech improves the most between this week and next week. By that theory, so will Boston College. So it cancels each other out, right? Um, I think sometimes sometimes improvement is noticeable. 
Sometimes it's just subtle little things that only football coaches notice. Like if there were communication issues the other night. Getting the plays like, in. Like te- yeah. we, if, as fans, you're not going to notice that. Uh, you, you're going to notice, oh, there's not as many penalties this week. Yeah. Uh, uh, a coach is going to say, well, we didn't have as many penalties this week because – we were just cleaner with 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 reading the signals and communicating and things like that. The, the first game, uh, I don't want to say jitters, but miscommunications of a new coaching staff and going through new things and a new communication system, uh, new terminology for the first time. Uh, you know, the issues kind of weeded themselves out after one week. So coaches see little things like that and view it as in, and view that as improvement. And fans will just look at oh, not as many just penalties this week. You're right, right. Yeah. Um, but but the whole improving from week one to week two thing, the, the encouraging thing is Virginia Tech has a lot more improving to do than a lot of teams. When you have 15 penalties and five turnovers, that's a lot of improving you can do. Can only go Where, up from here. Whereas some of the games I watched this weekend, like how much is App State going to improve from week one to week two? They look pretty good, you know? So it's relative, right? 61 points is hard to top. I can't, I can't wait for Virginia Tech to play North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> like the Carolina offense against the, or excuse me, the the Tech defense. I know I can't offense. talk. The Tech offense against the Carolina defense. Hopefully that'll be the week where like Thomas comes back and he's healthy, and then all the wide receivers are healthy. Because yes, the Tech offense can be can certainly can be quite a bit better at that point. At least we hope they can be better. October first. Can't okay, get here good. soon I was enough. I going to ask when it was, so it's October. 1st. <laughs> October first right. uh, in Chapel Hill. Katie, let's do one more from the YouTube. Patrick Watson asks, where does this loss rank in comparison to the worst VT losses over over the last 20-ish years? The worst loss by far will always and forever be Temple. That was the worst football team Virginia Tech has ever lost to. That football team had lost, I believe, to William and Mary the previous week. I mean, Temple was... uh, Temple went, I think, 1-10 that year. Or or maybe 2-9. That sounds interesting. uh, But, yeah, they were horrible. Um JMU's up there. JMU's up there to a certain extent, but the, you know the extenuating circumstances of that, you know, being five days after the most, in my opinion, arguably the most disappointing loss in, in Virginia Tech history, yeah. and nobody was ready for that game. I wasn't ready for it as a fan. I woke up that morning and I'm like, I don't want to go to this game. I'm yes, still... indeed. Uh, well, Temple lost to William and Mary, then lost to West Virginia, then beat Virginia okay. Tech. Okay, right. Wow, they were they were they were, that, they were horrible. Like that that I, like there are some games you wonder how how did that happen, and I actually don't know how that game physically could happen. Virginia Tech was so superior. Here's, uh, a, here's a piece of trivia you'll never get: What was Temple's other win that year? They beat Pittsburgh that year at Pittsburgh. No wow. Not that Pittsburgh was great. They were two and nine. There are other <laughs> right, but exactly. still, for Temple to actually win a road game, that's... I mean, that, and that that. That Virginia Tech team, nearly all those guys played in the national championship game the next the year. next year, that's right. And the, and the year before they lost to Temple. That is by far the worst. Um, now, now, the most painful loss ever for me still remains that 2010 Boise State yeah. game. Yeah, I would at agree FedEx. That. Not the national championship game. Yeah. That's like right behind it. <laughs> it's, uh, th- this, is, this one hurts for a whole different set of reasons. Like, like I said, when, when ODU beat Tech in 2018, tip your cap because they punched Tech in the mouth and earned it. They didn't earn this one, man. Uh, just, like, just gave it to them. Well, and, and for context, in that 2018 game, and then and again, Tech was 12th in the country heading into 13th. that game, 13th. Yeah, yeah. They were 29 point favorites in that game. On Friday, Tech was six point favorites. Yeah. Right, right. And this ODU team is a better team than that ODU team. But but at the same time, it's that ODU team actually had more playmakers on offense than this ODU team. Yeah. yeah. Um. And the the main reason it's disappointing for me. Is, is it's the first game of the Brent Pry era. And the honeymoon did not last very long, did it? And uh, hopefully it gets back on track. I mean, it was over on the first night. So, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. That's the disappointing part, man. Yeah. It's like, and, and it just leaves you wondering, are the issues we saw on Friday night, is that going to be normal for the Pry Is, is it systemic or, or, or was it a or one-off? Did just, or did yes. It was just a one-off thing that just happened to be in his first game. Yeah. And we won't know the answer to that question until we start playing more football games. Now, I think we all knew at some point this year that a day would come where something would happen in a football game that kind of reminded you of where you rank right now and how far you have to go and things like that. I did not think that would be against Old Dominion. Mm-hmm. I thought it would be against NC State or or somebody like that. Um, but, but again, the disappointing part is that it was us 
who gave us that reminder of exactly where we are in college. But it wasn't Old Dominion. <laughs> well, another big test coming up on Saturday. Excited for that. Again, preview podcast coming up Wednesday, getting ready for Boston College. Saturday, 8 p.m., I believe, is the kickoff. I think so, yeah. 8 p.m., so we got a late-night kick. Should be a fun one on Saturday night. And again, preview coming the, uh, up Wednesday. The forecast is rain. Like, it's going to rain all freaking week here. It's, I saw that. It's been oh, crazy it's... since the beginning of August. Rain, 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 rain. It's I think, raining right now. It didn't I think rain. It, I got you know. I actually had a nice weekend. You know, besides after the, I know it didn't I, rain I, after after the submarine tour, which was awesome. And I sat on the beach on Friday, and I was like, I don't really want to drive over to Norfolk <laughs> for this football game. It's such a perfect weather. It was like not too hot. The water temperature was excellent. So I finally drug myself off the beach and tried to drive over there, which turned out to be a complete waste of time because I never made it. Um, and then Saturday, I sat on the beach again. You know, so I actually had a nice weekend, except for the Virginia Tech football game. Yes, it and, is. And, a... and that's one of the reasons. It didn't rain. Weather was perfect. <laughs> that helped. It, I get back to the mountains on 81 yesterday, and it's pouring Coming rain. Coming up the hill, it yeah. started raining. Yeah, <laughs> it was horrible. And it's raining again today. It's going to rain all week. And I don't know, maybe... maybe uh, Maybe we'll have another, well, let's hope we don't have another 2007 Boston College game as far as the result goes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but fingers but, but, crossed but, for better, hey, for listen, good weather. Listen, this favors Tech if it rains. All BC can do is throw the football to one guy. Whoa, those sound like famous last words. <laughs> well, we'll dive into all of that <laughs> on Wednesday. And again, want to thank Katie and the YouTube chat for those questions. Uh, before we get out of here, Chris, what's coming up on TechSideline.com this week? Uh, are we having Monday thoughts today? I'm working on it, but, you know, uh, one of the things I want to do is travel to more road games this year and because there are so many that are close, and that's severe. And I'm putting this out there for the people who subscribe. <laughs> and when I put out a 1,500-word article, I don't, I don't want people to go, what the hell? I got home at 4 o'clock yesterday. That, that was a, a five-hour drive and watched the game as best I could. And the other, the other thing, other area where it impacts me is somebody emailed me or texted me and said, what do you think about prize comments after the game? Did you watch his interview? Well, no. I was at the game. You know, I was at <laughs> I the know. game. Then I was with my friends. Then I was driving. You know, so it, it uh, going to games like this that are five and six hour drives do impact my ability to put out, you know, a, a monstrous and doing a podcast, by the way. Right. <laughs> do impact my ability to put out a, a long arm. Normally it's Monday morning when you're writing the chunk of your. Used to be, yeah. Yeah, but, but now we have the podcast. Yeah. So. Anything else coming up? Whoa, lots oh. of stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're, 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 we're all on, man. No, no, nor, normally, I run my uh, my Inside the Numbers on Tuesdays. This year, I'm going to do it on Thursdays because Thursdays always is open for me. Plus, it gives PFF a chance to finish their grades. And I assume Brandon Patterson will have an article for us tomorrow. I think n normally his day is uh, is Tuesday. So, yeah, back into game mode, man. Perfect. Lots of content coming up on Tech Sideline. Again, we'll be back Wednesday for the preview podcast of BC first game in Blacksburg this season. Well, that'll wrap things up here on episode 252 of the Tech Sideline podcast. I want to thank everybody on set. Will Stewart, founder and general manager of Tech Sideline across the way. Catch him on Twitter at Will Stewart TSL. Chris Coleman to my right, lead analyst and columnist for Tech Sideline at Chris Coleman TSL on Twitter. Katie Adams in the fourth chair did a great job once again at Katie Six Adams on Twitter. Nick Brown, our greatest podcast producer in the land. Nick Brown 33 on Twitter if you want to give him a follow and i'm jake lyman signing off and have a great start to your week Hokies fans we'll talk to you on wednesday